All right, so in this video, what we're gonna do is take a look at some of the easiest and most common ways of blending and morphing between different objects or geometry as well as materials. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so a couple of different examples we're gonna be taking a look at today. Let's go ahead and start with our first example here. Um, where we're going to be taking a look at how we can go between different geometry. Now, it's important um, when you are morphing between different pieces of geometry that they have started as the same piece of geometry. So um, you will see with this cube, it's the same cube here, just with a bend deformer on it. And not just shape, but also the number of polygons and points an object has, as well as the way they are numbered, which uh, is a little bit tricky to kind of think about. But essentially, all you want to do is push and pull points, use deformers or sculpt in order to change the shape. You want to avoid tools like extrude or inset or weld, as those will break this, uh, this approach. And the same thing for the pose morph as well that we will see here very shortly. So the, the next step then is to make these objects editable. So I'm going to select our first cube, hit C on the keyboard to make it editable. For our second cube here, I'm going to right click and choose current state to object and then get rid of that cube. So now we have one where that def deformer has been collapsed or flattened into a piece of geometry, very much like flattening layers in Photoshop. So with that, we can then create a cloner and place both of these cubes inside. And we can see it actually hasn't done anything yet until we switch the mode here to blend. And now we can see how it's blending kind of from the left to the right uh, from our original cube to our cube that had the bend deformer on it. So this is kind of cool. You could certainly use an effector with a field on this to you know morph between these, blend between them. And we're gonna take it a little bit further though. Uh, we are going to have our cloner selected and create a plane effector. You can just place that in here to help stay organized. Uh, and in the parameter tab here, I want to uncheck position and then adjust the modify clone amount. You can see how that's really kind of going between, okay, our different steps here. Now, to, we are running into a bit of a problem because we are still set to grid mode. So I will switch this to linear and just make sure I set the count to one. And back in our effector with that modify clone property, you can see how it's now morphing between them as we increase this modify clone property. And you could, you know, take this a step further if you needed to and had multiple copies by using a field to do this as well. Okay, so I think I need to set the parameter, the modify clone back to 100%. There we go. And now we can blend between this way. And with a single one, maybe not so crazy, but if I was to come back here to say grid array, you can see how I'm now doing all three of these. And if this was at an angle, it would hit each cube, each clone just a little bit differently. So um, kind of a fun way to blend and morph between different pieces of geometry. Next up, pose morph. Okay, now I've talked about this a bit as well, but I wanted to create a single video that went over all of these techniques. Um, that way it's easier to find than just a snippet or a small little part of a video. Okay, because I know I've talked about the, the cloner example previously as well. So with our pose morph, what you want to do is very much like I said before with these different pieces of geometry. Start with one, turn it into the other, pushing and pulling points, sculpting the formers, that type of stuff. Avoid extrudes, welds, insets, all of that. All right, and you could have as many of these different facial expressions as you wanted. Um, the key though is once you are ready, select the base one. In this case, it'll be our sad pose. And I'm gonna right click, go to rigging, and choose pose morph, okay? So pose morph, all right, tag has been added. It's important here with the mixing to choose points last, as that's kind of like the last one you get. Um, so I'm going to check hierarchy on because we do have the eyes here as something separate. And then I will also check points on, which then takes me into the tag properties here. I'm still in edit mode. And before I switch the mode, I want to drag in any other poses I want. 
uh, with this warning or, or, I mean, really it's an option uh, if we want to make something absolute or relative. And absolute can, in theory, make it so our, our face would move over to the exact position um, our next pose is in. So um, relative is going to be the way to go for this one. You can see we automatically get our um, angry there, angry face there. And you can even adjust the strength here just to kind of test it out. Uh, and then when you're all done, you can switch to animate and you have a different slider for each pose you've added. Okay, as, of, as I've only really added one, that is what we're seeing. But if I had more, yeah, I could totally work with those. Now, there is also a morph deformer. And if you're wondering, well, wait a second, why aren't you showing that? Well, that's because it is very closely tied to our pose morph tag. They work together. Okay, so um, I'm not sure why that didn't work because it was changing thing, something previously. But um, yeah, the, the one advantage to using the morph tag that I've, or sorry, the morph, morph deformer that I've seen uh, is the ability to use fields. Okay, so um, as this is deformer, the same kind of hierarchy rules apply to it. Um, but uh, unlike in the pose morph tag with the morph deformer, you could use fields, which Probably isn't terribly useful for, you know, characters, simple facial expressions like this, but for other types of morphing between objects, I could see that being useful. All right, and that gets us to materials. Now, there are several different ways to morph or blend between materials, and the techniques end up being very similar. So um, I know in the past, I've actually used a lot of vertex tags to do this. Um, I, I did it just recently in a video um, about pyro and um, burning uh, a piece of paper. So I wanted to do something a little bit different. Uh, but like I said, the process is still very similar Two materials stacked on here. Um, and then I'm going to use the opacity property uh, to go back and forth between them. Okay, so I'm going to open up my material manager, as well as my node editor, I'm just going to dock that. All right. And in theory, you could do this all in one material um, by using a material blender. Okay, so material blender, maybe even a material layer as well. I think that's the newer version. Um, so you could do it all in here. Um, but the reason why you might not want to do that is because then it would limit your projection types. Okay, now there's definitely a projection node that you could add and work with. I find that very confusing and tricky. So um, I like being able to have separate uh, materials um, with separate material tags. That way I can have different projections, different settings there. And honestly, that is one of the advantages of using the vertex map as opposed to the ramp um, kind of technique I'm about to show you. Okay. Um, but in this case, since this is a relatively plain material, it's going to work just fine. So I'm going to take my ramp and what I'm going to do is drag that into my opacity property. And, you know, I think the render view still works a bit better than my perspective view for this. So I'm going to do that. I don't think I typically place my render view here. And what we'll see is that we are seeing that kind of blender transition here, but it's happening per polygon and it really isn't lining up. Okay. Uh, we could even solo the ramp if we wanted to, to see it on there. And sure enough, you know, it just, it doesn't line up. And that's because uh, the projection here is set to UVW mapping. So um, each cube is is going to have its own orientation with this. If we switch this to say flat, okay, now you can see how the projection looks a little bit more consistent. It's definitely going um, from the bottom to the top here. And so if I unsolo this, okay, we can now see that um, it's working pretty darn well. Now, I would also recommend, uh, actually, before I move on, yeah, with the projection set to flat here, going into texture mode with your, oh cool, they made it so you don't have to select your piece of geometry, just the texture tag, and scaling this up just a little bit larger. And that's gonna give you a little bit more wiggle room with this ramp, okay, so that we don't end up with just a little bit of rust um, on one side, or a little bit of the color where we don't want it. But from there, um, you could switch the direction of this by switching it to say horizontal, okay, keep it at vertical, um, but also animate this using our ramp options down here. Okay, so you could take this knot, move it all the way to the left here, keyframe it, and that's gonna be our 
um, red. And I still think, unless it's just the angle I'm looking at it, and yeah, maybe it's a reflection, but it almost looks like I still have a little bit of rust there maybe? No, I think it's just the lighting. But that's why we give this that little bit of extra space. And then I could just keyframe this. All right. And if you're going to use the radio buttons, which is my recommendation, you can see we have that right here. Um, going from clean to dirty. Right. And you can also adjust the interpolation. So if I set both of these to step, actually, I don't think I need to set both, just one. You can see we get a very hard transition here. And you may go, well, that's no good. Well, one of the reasons why I really like this ramp method is, um, one, it's pretty simple, but two, we also have built-in noise. So if I add in noise now, um, I'm going to get a very cool transition. All right. And that transition is going to change, is going to kind of morph and blend as we move it across our object. Now, you may notice there's actually a little bit of a problem. and that is our side right here. Honestly, either side, really. Okay. Uh, that is due to our material having this flat projection. So that's kind of one of the downsides. Now you can kind of cheat this if you change that projection to kind of match your camera angle. You could almost do that just by switching this to frontal. Um, and that can, you know, help with this. All right. But uh, frontal is kind of based on the camera angle. But even if you do flat, once you have an idea of your camera angle, go back into texture mode, rotate it, scale it up a little bit. And, you know, there we go. Right. So it's going to look good from um, that angle. But as we get to the side here, that may look a little bit strange. Turns out actually it looks pretty good. Um, but this is kind of the problem we run into with this particular method is uh, getting it to look good on um, all of our sides. Uh, if we have too much noise, it can be tough to tell. Frequency is the speed a little bit, but it also seems to influence the scale somewhat as well, right? That looks like a lot larger. If I go higher, say two, that tends to make it a bit um, smaller, okay? Uh, but that's how we can use this ramp method to blend between different materials. Once again, using the opacity, using the material stacking that is new relatively new um, to Redshift and really makes our lives a lot easier. Okay, so that will do it for our last technique when it comes to blending and morphing between different pieces of geometry and materials. All right, that will do it for this video. If you can do me a favor, like this video if you found it useful and informative. Comment if there's anything else you would like to see me make a video of and subscribe so that you can see when I release uh, more videos. So. That will do it for this one. Until next time, take care.